This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, which is currently introducing its new base membership. What is base membership? Well, it's the AAOMC's new free introductory membership type designed to help educate doctors on myopia control and orthokeratology. Whether you are brand new, an experienced fitter searching for pearls, or someone who's dabbled in the past and ready to step up their game, AAOMC base membership can help. And it's free. So what do you have to lose? Go to orthokacademy.com, click on the practitioner button, and join us. Join the war against the myopia epidemic. Welcome back to The Corrected View. This is a podcast about myopia control, ortho K, and the people who are devoted to its role in specialty care. And if you've noticed behind me, this is the special holiday 2020 edition. And even though this has been kind of a crappy year, uh, we're still going to try to have some fun with it and, and uh, have a good time for our Christmas episode, our season's greetings episode. And uh, and this episode is, uh, I got our usual panel with us. I say usual, but they've only been with us for one so far, but they're going to be our usual panel. <laughs> I've got Dr. Cheryl Chapman and Jonathan Schoner, two of our brand new bo- board members. Cheryl and Jonathan, welcome back to the program. Thank you. All right. And uh, I also have our returning champion uh, as far as a returning guest and co-host, and that's our president, Paul Levine. Paul, welcome back to The Corrected View. We're glad to have you here with us. Thank you. And our special guest expert for this episode is none other than Kathy Stern. And that's why we're doing this specific episode. Kathy, welcome back or welcome to The Corrected View podcast. Thank you. So this episode is going to be about binocular vision anomalies and how they impact myopia control. And this comes from a discussion that got started in the AAOMC Google group, which my goodness, if you're not in that uh, listserv, if you're not a part of the academy, if you are a part of the academy and you are not a part of the Google group, then you need to get in there because we have such great discussions happening all the time about myopia control and vision therapy. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Paul, why don't you tell us about our topic and get us kicked off and ready to go? Okay, great. Love to do it. Thanks. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of confusion, maybe. Um, um, well, it, the conversation really started with how does behavioral um, optometry and vision therapy evaluations and how does that really um, jive with what we're trying to do with ortho K, soft contact lenses, atropine, and, and, and the various methods of using um, our myopia control, um, you know, uh, tools and tricks. So we want to understand um, from the expert a little bit more about the binocular vision anomalies and, and, and how they impact progressive myopia um, and, and, and as, you know, and as practitioners, how, you know, what we should be looking for and some of the red flags, um, what can we do? What should we be referring to behavioral ODs and vision therapy experts, you know? And so, uh, you know, ultimately I think that's where, you know, the discussion pushed into this. So, um, so I have a lot of questions and I'm sure Cheryl and Jonathan do too. Um, and, you know, so Kathy, do you want to just kind of, um, I don't know, maybe introduce yourself and, and, you know, your expertise and credentials? So I have been practicing for many years and I probably for a good 20 years, I've had a vision therapy only practice. But when I say vision therapy, it's really a practice devoted uh, to looking at more functional vision issues, more binocular vision issues. Although when I I had a a private practice uh, that was a general practice before this practice, and I did many of the same tests because I felt that that helped me prescribe generally uh, well for patients. I even did uh, some ortho K back then when it was just a daytime lens. When you couldn't even had had you couldn't have people sleep in them because the oxygen permeability of the lenses wasn't good enough. Um, and then uh, when I 
uh, changed practices and decided to do a practice that was all vision therapy, I still always had that sense that I wanted to try to control myopia because it wasn't good for anyone to become too myopic. And, uh, and also sometimes if you look at myopia, it's not the problem in and of itself, it's often the symptom of a problem. So if you look at the underlying driver of it, then you might decide that there's a binocular vision issue. And when you take care of that, you often slow down that progression of myopia, in some cases even reverse it. Uh, and so that has kind of been a focus for me all the time. And I then did add back um, a small amount of ortho K in my practice, but I have people around me that do it and do it more than I do. So sometimes I would be referring patients. But what I think is that you wanna have as many tools in your toolbox as you can have. And so that means thinking about soft multifocal lenses. It means thinking about ortho K. It means thinking about when do you want to give someone an opportunity to do some active vision therapy and who are the patients who might benefit from uh, all or any of those things or even atropine. You know, when, when do you want to use those things? How do you want to use them? And you don't want to ignore any of them. And so I was doing most of that in my practice. So it's a little different than a practice maybe that doesn't do it. But I do think that um, the first thing is that everyone should be doing some very basic binocular testing, which I did when I had my general practice with everyone. It only added a few minutes to my examination. And it really helped to guide me in terms of what might be the driver of whatever was going on not just the issue itself. You know, if someone comes in and says, I can't see well at FAR, uh, is that really the problem? It's a problem to them, but is that really the underlying condition that's driving it, their system in that direction? And when you can identify, uh, for example, some near point issues or, uh, you know, some other binocular vision conditions, then treating those things does make a difference and does slow things down. Great. So I think I might want to jump into a topic that's been talked about long and 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 uh, but not very deep. And we, you know we're all trained, you know, to look for something called esofixation disparity. You know, we've been told and we've been trained that you know myopes with esofixation disparity are often going to progress more rapidly, and. I would love to understand the difference between an e esofixation disparity and esophoria or esotropia or convergence insufficiency. Um, and if you could maybe try to identify the difference between those things and, and also how would you even go about testing for a fixation disparity? Okay, so I think fixation disparity is one of those things that, you know, my thought about it was always, I hope there weren't too many too many questions on a, on a test that I would be taking in school about fixation disparity, because I never felt like I understood it as well as I did other things. But generally, uh, fixation disparity is really a way of looking at kind of the posture of the visual system when you're looking at it from a binocular point of view. And so when you're doing that, you're not dissociating the person, you're not doing anything to, um, to have them look with one eye at a time. You're trying to find really a basis for it. Uh, and some people feel it's a more realistic view of binocular vision. Now, interestingly, in the US and in Europe, we look at fixation disparity a little bit differently. In the US, the um, way we look at it tends to be a little bit more looking at the motor aspects of binocularity. And in Europe, they tend to do it on more of a sensory basis. They do some testing there that we don't really do here. Um, but all that aside, if you're looking at someone and you're doing, for example, a cover test, if you see an esophoria or an exophoria, not even strabismus, um, you're looking at something that happens when you cover one eye at a time. And so it's, a, it's different than a fixation disparity, but it's also an indication of how someone may be uh, posturing their eyes or what happens when uh, their system is pushed to, a lim to the limit. So they may not be uncomfortable necessarily, but it may say, well, what happens toward the end of the day? Do they have the, the stamina and the stability in order to maintain good binocularity without paying a price for that? 
And I think myopia is a price that we pay for that. Um, and so I think the key really is uh, if you do see someone who, who maybe is ortho on a cover test, because I don't think we can see that kind of movement until it's maybe three or four prism diopters, maybe even five or six, uh, might they have a fixation disparity? And I have to be honest, I don't always test for that uh, because I also look at their fusional reserves and other things that should tell me whether they have enough, again, stamina and stability. But I do think if they have some um, complaints or you do see them progressing in myopia, that would be another test that you could do. And there are what they call fixation disparity cards. Most, And there are distance charts that have them on as well. Some of the computerized charts have them now. And usually you wear some type of lenses, either polarized or maybe red and blue, so that one eye has one view and the other eye has another view. And then you're looking how, when they're looking with both eyes together, how the eyes are posturing together. And you can use small amounts of prism to line things up better for them if they don't line up well by themselves. Uh, and there are some people who with very, very small, one or two prism diopters, sometimes even a half, really does make a big difference to them comfort wise. That's one. And the question is, if you do that, will that be one of the tools that might slow down uh, myopic progression? Um, and I haven't seen any statistics on that. But again, uh, we don't always know who's going to respond to the treatment in a certain way. You know, I, I think that anything we have, even when we say it works well, it may work for 80%, but what if that patient's in the 20% and we don't know that? So I think that, that where we are left is first, when we're seeing any patient, are we doing at least some basic tests of binocularity in a way that we can at least know their status even before they become myopic? You know, maybe it's even a young child who isn't myopic yet. You know, do we have some baseline to follow and watch or something that might be a flag that maybe they will end up there? Um, because in young children, the print is large and they're not maybe reading as long as, and as intensively, although uh, we'll see what happens after COVID and everybody's on screens for a long time. Um, there have been a number of articles saying that it's likely we'll see more myopia. Um, my col I've asked a lot of my colleagues and no one says they've seen an actual trend, but uh, in both op optometric uh, journals and in ophthalmological literature, there have been articles saying that it's likely that that's what we may see. Um, but I don't think anyone knows for sure because, uh, you know, there's so many different factors. But um, I do think that if everyone, uh, every doctor who examines a patient starts with a baseline, some basic tests of binocularity, uh, it can be stereo and maybe I'd like to see virgences because I like to see a, a break and a recovery and just see uh, how that looks. And, um, and then doing a cover test, doing a near point of convergence. Those things don't take very long and they give you a lot of information. Um, and so when you have that, even if the person is not having any issues and you don't have any major concerns, it's something that you can look at when they come back again and see if there's any kind of a trend, if things are getting a little better, a little worse. Maybe one day you examine them in the morning and another day at the end of a long day of school and you might see some differences. So if we all did that as a baseline, then I think we could jump in early. And and really, it's not just about controlling myopia, it's preventing it as much as we can. Yeah, that's great. That's terrific. You know, I want to I want to continue on on with a couple of more questions, especially about binocularity. So what I have found and I don't know if you've seen it, Kathy, I don't know, Cheryl, if you see it, but I seem to see a lot of the rapid progressors tend to be exo. Like I'm seeing big, intermittent, large angle exotropias. I mean, intermittent, but you know, not constant exos. But you know, these divergence excesses, especially where you know you do a distance cover test, and and you know that covered eye just goes way out. Um, and I'm just curious if if where you see how that might drive myopia. I mean, my own opinion and my own theory is that. They're using their fusional vergences to basically essentially keep their eyes straight. 
in other and and I think that that's also taxing the accommodative system and perhaps creating an excessive accommodation, um, almost a muscle spasm that could be sort of uh, either it, um, pretending to be myopia or or truly generating myopia. So that's sort of an interesting uh, point, it, especially when you're talking about divergence excess. Because if you do, for example, stereopsis, those patients do better with third degree stereopsis than they do with first degree stereopsis. So uh, if they're doing, uh, for example, going through like a school screening and stereopsis is now part of that screening, they're going to pay um, where the average person who is having more difficulty, for example, at near uh, may not. Um, and the other is when you look at how we want to treat something like divergence excess, there are sort of two schools of thought. One is, without really saying what's driving the condition, is just to teach people diplopia awareness, teach them to see double when their eyes are not working together at distance, so they can then, on a motor basis, bring their eyes more together. Uh, the other is, the other opinion is, that when you see divergence excess, the problem started at near. And what they really need is low plus for near. And if that's true, um, I agree with you that any kind of convergence issue, uh, even near point of convergence being receded, most of those patients have more of an accommodative issue than they do a convergence issue. And I don't know if that's always looked at. I mean, I understand that they both work together. And I understand that, in my view, you need to localize before you can accommodate because you've got to know where you're looking and where you want to make something clear. But what I do find is that if you just look at that as an issue of motor, the motor system and converging the eyes, you could be working on activities uh, for someone to learn to converge better. And one is you better ask them while you're asking them to converge if the target is still clear because some of them will over accommodate to pull the eyes in more. And the other is that uh, sometimes they don't seem to get better from some of the basic activities you think would be helpful because they have more of an accommodative issue than they, than they do a convergence issue. And many of those patients, if you put them in low plus or low plus with a very small amount of uh, maybe one prism diopter base in each eye, you will see them come into a more normal function. Hmm. Uh, and so it does relieve some of that, you know, accommodative stress and you still may need to work on that, but you will see a change and you will see the convergence improve uh, and you would think if you put plus on, if you really think of the optics, you would think the convergence would become harder for them and it actually becomes easier. And I know that they used to say that if you did put plus on and, for example, the near point of convergence reduced, they would call that sometimes a pseudo convergence insufficiency, that, that it really wasn't convergence insufficiency. But I don't think we have a good enough definition of convergence insufficiency. I think it's an observation that we make and I'm not sure that, that there isn't more than one driver for the observation that someone's near point of convergence is receded. So I think over time, we're gonna find that, that maybe it's a few different things going on, uh, partly on the accommodative side and, and partly uh, in terms of convergence, because uh, when I work with adults, for example, who have had accident or injury, brain injury, and they demonstrate convergence insufficiency, they do not come around and they do not recover as quickly or as easily or even with some of the same activities than uh, an eight-year-old with a slightly receded near point of convergence. So I think, I think there's something different going on and, and I'm hoping over time we'll be able to figure that out a little more. Um, Cheryl, do you have, um, do you wanna add something to this? Before yeah, I it's really, um, it's just really great to listen to you talk, Kathy, because you obviously know so much about this. And I think that, you know, binocular vision is really um, difficult for some doctors to get excited about. Some doctors kind of shy away from it. Um, but as more and more doctors become really interested in myopia management, I think it's really um, very important that we continue to make this part of the discussion. Um, as I was hearing your last comments, I was thinking about um, how you talked about accommodation and 
um, one that I am always really um, putting at the top of my list to do with my patients is to check their lag of accommodation uh, and how, you know, you'll see some studies that say a high lag of accommodation is associated with progressive myopia. But then I have also seen and heard sometimes that there's a little dispute about that. Could you talk to us a little bit more about that, Kathy? Well, again, I think that um, if you're measuring a lag of accommodation, uh, you want you want to say, okay, if accommodation and convergence are not in the same place, what does that really mean? And so if you're needing to uh, converge in order to be in the right place and you absolutely need to accommodate to a high level because what you're looking at, for example, is small or detailed, then there it may be more of an issue that there is that lag of accommodation. If there's a small lag of accommodation or even a moderate lag of accommodation, but what the person is looking at is not so precise or not so small or not so detailed, they may not uh, feel it, they may not notice it, and they may not, over time, have a big effect from it. Um, I think that when we have someone who has to do uh, a lot of near work, especially when print gets smaller uh, and, you know, everything is crowded more on a page, that may be different. But, you know, today a lot of students are working on screens. So if they have an issue, they can make it bigger. You know, they can change the spacing between the paragraphs. They can change how wide the lines are. And I don't know whether they always have the freedom in school to do that with the text that they're presented with. And maybe a lot of to the actual text, they're reading a book. And so, uh, and also they tend to sit a little bit further back. So the demand on even the convergence is a little bit less. Because I've always over the years had children come in and just say, oh, I don't have a problem. And I ask them, well, how do you hold the book? And you put it, you know, you hand it to them about where you know they should hold it. And the first thing they do is move it a little bit away from them. And as long as the print in the book is large enough, they, that's all they do. They just extend it out a little bit. And then they don't, at least they don't feel they have a problem. And in some cases, uh, they don't uh, have an issue going back and forth. Uh, but that's something else that I do a lot with patients is um, I hand them a near point card and maybe I have them look at the first or second paragraph on a near point card. And then I put up uh, maybe a 2025 line across the room and I ask them to just go back and forth, not to just clear. So as soon as it's clear, they should clear enough when they look close there. And I ask them to go back and forth for 30 seconds or a minute and to, to tell me if either in either place things get blurry or more challenging to clear. Sometimes you can see that because I usually stand to the side and I can watch their eyes go back and forth and I can see them slow down. And, um, and I think when someone demonstrates that, especially if they're in a situation where they have to do more of that, they're not going to have the stamina and stability, and it probably does drive their nearsightedness. Um, you know, I had, I had a, a very high-level athlete here the other day who was here ostensibly for some sports vision uh, testing, and she was about a one-diopter myope, and she was wearing contact lenses, and I could see that she didn't have a lot of good uh, stamina and stability of binocularity in some ways. And I, so I had her look back and forth and, and she had difficulty um, clearing the near print. She could do it, but it, she was telling me she could feel the effort. And she said, you know, when I think about it, I notice that myself, that if I'm studying and I'm on my computer and then I look up, it's not always clear right away. And I put some plus it near and, um, she went, oh, wow, you know, this is unbelievable. I can just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's it's really easy to do. And my eyes are already more comfortable. And I, I don't remember at what age she became myopic. But I have to tell you, it's likely we could probably reduce some of that for her because it probably came, again, from a binocular vision issue. Um, and whether if she needed some, uh, uh, she wasn't terribly ESO or EXO. So sometimes in those patients, especially Paul, as you were mentioning, if they're ESO, I will put them in a multifocal lens. Uh, 
I used to love the lens and I don't remember the name of it, but I think it was Cooper Vision had a lens that had about a plus one ad. And I used to use that a lot. Uh, and then they stopped making it. That's the ProClear um, and the EP. Optics what was it called? It was called ProClear EP. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, we used um, to fit a ton and that of those. was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it didn't really seem to interfere uh, in any way because some of the lenses, you know, even with a distance centered uh, lens, sometimes there seems to be some issue uh, that the near part gets in the way a little bit, depending on their pupil size and how much the lens moves. But that lens was great. And um, I think the, um, uh, the newer VTI lens, the, uh, seems to be one that that we can potentially use, uh, especially in kids. I'm not sure it works as well for adults, or at least I haven't had the experience that it works as well for some of my adults, but it, it does work for the kids. And I've seen, you know, patients who were 20 of each getting more myopic, and I put, you know, even a multifocal with a high ad, like, like the studies show, and, you know, they go to ortho. So they have a high ACA ratio potentially, and although they don't always test it as high as the response that I seem to get with the contact lens, but it does seem to, to slow things down. Um, and so I, again, it's just another tool in the toolbox, and it doesn't mean that that patient wouldn't ultimately become a, a patient where you would think about, okay, but I know that uh, some people feel, and again, it really does depend on, on their cornea, uh, you know, sometimes for some of the low, um, low myopes, when they just have, you know, minus one or minus two, they may not be the best candidate for orthokeratology. Um, and that's where a soft multifocal lens or plus veneer or whatever uh, they're interested in using and wearing uh, really, I think, takes the stress off and off their system, helps to rebalance accommodation and convergence. And I think, at least in my experience, it seems to slow down the progression of myopia. I mean, we, we can't test an individual person and say, well, this is what would have happened if we didn't do it. Here's what happens if we do. Although um, Brian Holden uh, Vision Institute in Australia does have an online calculator where you can go in and say, here's the person's age and here's how myopic they are today. And here's roughly the likelihood of how myopic they'll be in you know, one year, two year, five years with treatment or without treatment. And that's a nice thing to be able to show uh, parents because you, you're you not making it up. They've done a lot of work and a lot of study for a long time and it's a free calculator that you can use online. It's very nice and it's very nice to use. Yeah, that's a good, really good point. You know, I wanna, um, I wanna throw something else at you, kind of a little bit different. Um, we've all seen you know, monocular myopes, you know, we got you, you, these kids who come in that seem to have reasonably decent binocularity, but one eye is a minus 150 or a minus two, and the other eye is plano or even plus a little bit, you know, and, um, and I'm curious what you think causes something like that. And, and, I, and I'd also mention that if I've done a, a one-eyed ortho K patient. Sometimes after I can fix that myopic eye, the what was plano or hyperopic eye almost becomes a little bit myopic over time. And then they end up in two ortho K lenses. So can you kind of maybe break that down a little bit for us? So I think there's a couple of things. Um, not everybody works as equally with the two eyes as you think. You know, when we think of binocularity, we think of both eyes converging the same to the same place. But some people's computers are off to the side a little bit. Maybe they happen to sit in a favorite chair and their head is turned a little bit or their body is turned a little bit. Um, I've had especially adults who come in and they're starting to be myopic, maybe a half, three quarters in one eye and not the other. And the first thing I'll say to them, oh, I bet your computer is more over on that side. And they look at me like I have two heads because they want to know how do I know what their office looks like. And um, I say, well, you know, if your two eyes are not trying to work equally, never mind that they may not have started out with the same skill, uh, it's going to show up over time. And so I do think there are some postural issues. 
to it. Um, I also think that, you know, your system is always going to try to preserve clarity as best it can. And I do think that some patients who develop astigmatism, uh, in some cases, I look at that as, you know, you're trying really hard to have one channel at least that's clearer and one channel that becomes unclear. Unfortunately, after a very small amount, it just kind of messes things up everywhere. But, um, but I look at it that way. Um, and I do think that sometimes if they become myopic in one eye, the question really becomes, did we see them at an earlier time when they may have been more hyperopic in the eye that did not become myopic? And so there was an imbalance there. It's just not one that was interfering or that they noticed because if someone is, you know, Plano and plus one, they're not going to complain. And then by the time they come to you, now they're Plano in the other eye and minus one. And so uh, we don't know that. Um, but I do think that when you see that and then you do, for example, ortho K, and now the other eye starts to become myopic, the question is two things. One is the system try to, trying to level itself out. So I would much rather have a patient who's becoming minus one in each eye than being somewhat anisometropic. In other words, if they're going to be Plano and minus one, it's not a big difference and it's not that they can't fuse, but that balance point, you know, if they're going to become a little bit myopic in both eyes, that may be the way that they can establish better binocularity. That's one. Um, and then I think the other is that if you are taking away that myopia in one eye, the question is, why did they develop myopia at all, even in one eye? And I tend to look at a lot of myopia as an adaptation to some level of visual stress. Yes, there can be genetics. Yes, there can be nutritional factors. But there's a lot of uh, fact, a lot going on with the kind of environment that you spend time in. And so because of that, if you take away that adaptation, they have to make it again. In fact, I think that's one of the issues that sometimes happens when we do prescribe for the myopia, even in both eyes. If you give someone the minus one on each eye and they develop that minus one to help at near or to uh, relieve some kind of binocular issue, then now they have to go and do it again. So now they become a minus two or a 150 because Th there was an advantage. There was no advantage for seeing at distance, but there may have been an advantage for working at near. Um, you know, I'm a myop, and when I take my glasses off, there's nothing like the clarity when I have to hold things very close, but it's kind of a nice feature to have. Or someone who's someone who stays under minus two, they're going to love it when they get to be 40, and they don't need near lenses, but they are, are in the meantime, going to have an issue seeing far away. Um, and so I think when you take that away by doing the ortho K, now the other eye starts to become a little bit myopic because they're needing to make that adaptation on some level, but maybe because you've also now balanced the eyes from an acuity standpoint, uh, maybe they don't get too myopic because now they can establish, uh, maybe they are establishing some better binocularity and also just the way the ortho K lens changes the cornea. Are they developing a little, a little plus there for near, um, potentially in the reshaping of the cornea? I know there's been, you know, some talk about that. I can't say that I'm well versed in that piece, but um, I know that that there may be some changes that are beneficial. Um, but I'm not surprised that then the other eye starts to become a little bit myopic because. They became myopic to begin with for some reason, especially if they're a little bit older. You know, when I, if you have a, a six-year-old who's becoming myopic, depending on their family history and depending on the activities they do or don't do, uh, if they're, you know, spending time outdoors, if they're not spending hours on end on, on near activities, um, you know, that may be a little different situation. But if I have anyone in my office who's, let's say, 12 and up, you know, 12 to 15, and they're becoming myopic, I have to tell you, I look at that as 95% environmental. At that point, it's probably not genetics very much. It's likely that nutrition isn't playing a huge role at that point. It's got to be 
what they're doing and how they're doing it and why their system doesn't handle that stress as well as the next person who does not become myopic. Well, it depends what the other person has in terms of their, you know, overall constitution, but also sometimes you find that the other person isn't doing as much of that in your work. When I see children who have learning, some type of learning disability, if they've been diagnosed as having a learning disability, um, most of them have very good distance acuity because guess what? They're not doing a whole lot of near work. They don't read a lot. They don't, uh, you know, today maybe they'll be on their phones more and on their computers more and maybe we'll see some differences. But in the past, I can tell you that most of those children are not uh, myopic, I think, because they don't do at least some of the things that drive myopia. Yeah, that's a cool observation. I've noticed that myself. Yep. Another thing that I um, wanted to kind of bring up, I think it always bears repeating that, um, you know, we've seen the studies that under correction of myopia is not a good way to manage myopia. Um, I think it's always important to keep that in mind. Most of what you've talked about, Kathy, is um, really focused on, you know, the binocular vision system and, and kind of along those lines. But um, can you tell us a little bit how you feel about the peripheral defocus theory and how heavily you think that weighs in when you spend so much time thinking about it from a binocular vision perspective? Okay, so I think there's a couple of pieces. One is, I know that the studies have shown that uh, undercompensating is maybe even detrimental. You know, maybe that even drives myopia more. I have always, when I work with patients, tried to prescribe the minimum plus that they need at distance. And I think that a lot of doctors tend to go a little farther than that and maybe over minus a little bit. And I wanna give them as, even without an ad, even without adding more plus for near, I certainly wanna keep the, the distance minus to the minimum that's going to do the job. Um, and if I am going to undermine some, someone because, you know, they don't want to wear an ad or I just uh, feel like they're just beginning to become myopic, maybe I'm seeing them at the end of a day, maybe some of that is uh, still shifting uh, earlier, in, you know, in the day, I might not find it in the same way. I'll, I might undermine someone by a quarter or a half, but I always felt that it didn't make sense to undermine us by a lot because I felt that that also put a stress on the person's system and likely was not helpful. So uh, I don't think it was, I, I don't, I never did a lot of under minus in a big way. If I did it, it was always in a small way, maybe, maybe no more than a half. And, and in some cases, when you're doing your refraction, you tend to do it monocularly. And you'd be surprised if you finish doing your refraction and you have someone even in a foropter uh, and you now go back a quarter step or a half step when both eyes are open, they're going to tell you it's just as clear. Maybe if you do a red green balance, they will be a little bit in the red. Um, they certainly won't be a quarter in the green, but it's, an, it's good enough for most of the things that they need to do. Um, you know, so unless they're needing to drive at night or something where they absolutely maybe even do a sport where they need very, very sharp distance acuity, they usually feel fine. And you need to think about that. I mean, I always said to myself, well, if a patient comes in after a year and now they're half diopt or more myopic than they were last year, how long have they been walking around in those glasses that were under minus? Did they become under minus two months after they got the last pair six months nine months i don't know when that happened no and if it's a gradual process how gradual is it and how does it actually happen and so by the time they're complaining about it they had to have had some of that going on but i don't always know for how long so clearly they tolerated a small amount of of being under minus for a period of time so they may not always need it um, depending on Again, what is their day like? What are the kinds of things that they're that they're doing, and uh, what would be the right thing for them to have? So today, having you know soft multifocal lenses that work well, um, 
I think can be something because not everyone wants to wear bifocal glasses, although it's very interesting that some of the studies have shown that the best thing in terms of a bifocal would be an executive bifocal, which is exactly what we used to do many years ago because we really felt that was the right thing to do somehow, even though you know when you converge it near, you're not using the periphery of the lens to see, and yet we used to always prescribe executive uh, bifocals, or maybe if it was a very small frame, I'd do a flat top 35. But I, I, I did that for many, many years until it became sort of, you know, not so, uh, not so okay to go around wearing eyeglasses that had a line on them. I think when progressive lenses came along, it, it kind of messed us up for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. in that, in that cosmetically, they didn't want to want to have that anymore. Now you talk with kids and you say bifocal with a line, they don't even know what you're talking about. Um, and then the newer lenses, um, I'm, I think that the research is certainly showing that if you can have more plus in the periphery, that that makes sense. And I think that's kind of what we were doing when we were prescribing these executive bifocals years ago. But some of the lenses, the way they're designed, it seems like there's also going to be a certain amount of blur in the periphery, like the DIMS lens or a couple of others that are they're working on. And... I don't know how well everyone will tolerate that because we don't have the approval here yet for some of those. And um, I also wonder how much it will cause them to tunnel a bit and not keep periphery as open because I do know that if you have a patient looking at the chart and you just talk with them about noticing the edges of the chart rather than just kind of the middle where they're reading, sometimes they'll read another line or two. Um, and so you need that peripheral input to kind of know where to look before you can make it clear. I really believe you have to localize before you accommodate. And so um, I don't know uh, if it does slow down the myopia, how much it will it, and uh, will it have other kinds of effects over time uh, in terms of that, you know, if you take it away, what's going to happen? I have so a question. I think the jury's still question. out. Some of those things are, you know, quite new. Yeah. I have a, I have have a question. question. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Schoner uh, has been in and out with us, uh, hasn't been able to stay connected, but he's still in the chat. And I said, hey, Jonathan, why don't you uh, send me your questions or comments and I'll read them out for Kathy. And this will be good practice because in the future, this podcast is going to be done live and we'll have a chat room. And so just, just go with me here. Okay. All right, so Jonathan said, Kathy, can you comment on our myopia control patients who are currently in vision therapy? I know it may depend on the specific conditions we're addressing in therapy, but would you recommend in any way adjusting a patient's therapy program and exercises who currently is being treated with myopia control utilizing ortho-K? So Kathy, what do you think? So I think that if you have a patient where you're doing ortho-K, but you also have put them into a vision therapy program because you found that there was a binocular uh, vision issue, the question is that while they're wearing the ortho-K lens, you're not necessarily going to notice a big shift in myopia. Um, you may, when you test them, see that it's shifted some. But remember, any any contact lens, even when we used to do hard lenses, the nice thing was, you know, the patient could stay in the same lens because even the tear lens, you know, in those patients created a lens in a way that they didn't always need a change in prescription, even though you might measure that. So I do think that it makes sense to give someone the opportunity to develop the best underlying visual skills and abilities possible. And then if you're doing the ortho K, the question is, will those patients, although in general, the studies have shown that if you stop wearing the lenses, you may go back to the level of myopia where you had been, but not necessarily a lot more than that. Will we see that it helps in some way to keep them from regressing, if not less than where they were, certainly not more than where they were. And I don't, I think those are hard studies to do, but I always feel like if, if, if I'm doing any treatment, if there's no downside to it and only an upside to it, and really with vision therapy, active vision therapy, uh, there's 
almost no downside if you choose patients appropriately. There's almost zero downside and only an upside that someone will have stronger skills that will just be another level of reinforcement against all the stresses that we think are part of the driver of myopia. And you know, the ortho K may be in the beginning because someone doesn't want to wear eyeglasses and they like seeing clearly all day and that's great. But um, is it still appropriate to have their system become as strong as it can be? And what will that effect be down the road if they decide to discontinue the orthokeratology? I'd like to ask you, Kathy, um, what are your, th tell me how you utilize cycloplegia, uh, you know, um, especially in a situation where you might be trying to identify pseudomyopia. Um, do you, do you think all of these patients should be cycloplegia? Do you think cyclopentylate is the chosen one? Can you use tropicamide? Can you just kind of talk a little bit about your thoughts on cycloplegia? I can. I will tell you that I do very little cycloplegia, cycloplegia or doing cycloplegia with patients. I don't use it a lot because I have found that at least my prescribing and my uh, ability to determine maybe a near lens and even looking at uh, how I can certainly figure out if someone uh, needs either less minus or more plus uh, for distance, that if I do my testing in the way that I do, if I uh, push, sort of push plus, not, not minus, um, I do occasionally have patients where, you know, you add a quarter and then a minute later they're more myopic and they want more and, you know, would it be helpful to cycloplege them? Well, again, it may show you that there's more plus in the system, but the question is when that wears off, where are they gonna be? And so I'm always wanting to try to prescribe for them in a way that reduces the dependency on the minus, does not over minus them. And if anything, those are likely patients where I'm gonna wanna try to get them into as much plus at near as is appropriate for them as well. Um, and also, perhaps, if nothing else, add in some accommodative uh, activities that they can do at home, even if they don't come into a formal vision therapy program, because that's likely uh, what's going on. Um, I do know that in a lot of the research, they're talking about cycloplegia uh, patients in order to look at, or more fully look at, the changes in myopia. But they also now talk about the fact that maybe the level of myopia that we measure is not as important a measure as measuring axial length. So the question is, if we're gonna look at axial length, how much myopia they're showing at that moment in time, knowing that those measures are not consistent, even by a quarter diopter, even from morning till night in some patients, you know, are we going to become less dependent on the need to say, well, if we don't measure with cycloplegia, it's not good enough. It may be important for research, but but on a practical level, I don't find that it's terribly useful because, you know, it's sort of like um, when you when you talk about a, ch a young child and you cycloplegia them and you find out they're, a, you know, plus six and you go, well, maybe I'll just give them a plus four. It's like, you know, the rules, the rules of what, how you're going to change that or cut that or what's going to happen when those drops wear off, it just doesn't seem to, to have a good way of telling what that should be. Um, and so I try to do it in as most natural a situation, a natural way as possible. And I do think you can do it with, by adding plus as you do it. You can look with your retina scope and see uh, how stable it is. I, so I don't, I don't use cycloplegia very often. Okay. <clears throat> um, maybe, you know, one of the topics that came up recently in our chat room there uh, when, when this whole discussion was happening about myopia control and vision therapy and orthokeratology and how they blend, um, there was some talk about dynamic retinoscopy. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's a poorly understood 
um, technique. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what, what it is, how to do it, and what it tells you? Sure. So the idea behind any of the dynamic retinoscopies, and there's more than one type that can be done, is that you are trying to look at how the system is telling you when it's in the best balance and, of course, if there's, for example, a lag of accommodation. But in some cases, it's also just being able to look at when you're getting that patient to engage with you. So when I working, for example, with special needs children. You know, sometimes you try different lenses and you just find there's a lens where the uh, retinoscopic reflex is the brightest and they're clearly much more engaged with not only the instrument, but with the world when you prescribe that particular lens. And so uh, you can choose to do MEM, you can choose to do um, stress, what's called stress point retinoscopy, uh, stress point response. You know, there are different kinds, there's book, there are different kinds of near retinoscopy, but the key with any of them is, are you able to do it in a way that you notice the changes in, for example, the retinoscopic reflex, and are you comfortable then with appreciating that perhaps that's the best lens for near? You know, it, it always interests me that, um, that people talk about eyesight and say, well, I have 20-20 vision and it's perfect. Or they say, well, this child passed a school screening, you know, they're 20-20, never mind the discussion about how that's not an eye exam um, or, or a vision exam. But aside from that, you know, all these people are out there talking about how everybody sees 20 feet away. And I want to know how many of us ever look 20 feet away in the course of our day. You know, my exam room is only 10 or 12 feet. My vision therapy room is only, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet. I, you know, I, I've never, I, I don't really look that far much of the time. And when I do, it's not at, at a lot of detail. You know, I'm not just like the letter chart that I put up. That's not what I'm mostly looking at. If I'm out driving, maybe a, a street sign or a road sign. But other than that, you know, we spend all this time refining a prescription for a place in space where we're going to do the least amount of our work. And we should spend at least as much time, if not more, refining a prescription that's appropriate for where we're gonna spend most of our day, which is generally within arm's reach. Not completely, but that's where we spend a lot of our time. And that's where the stress is greater often. So it always, it always um, kind of astounds me that we talk about this metric that's not maybe unimportant and it's useful, but it, it doesn't really relate to what most of us do all day long. And so how do we do just as good a job? How do we do essentially a near refraction like you do a distance refraction? And that's exactly what I do. Near retinoscopy is one way to look at that. Um, fuse cross cylinder at near is another way, NRA, PRA. I mean, there's, there's different tests that you can look at balance it near and I think that's really important and I would suggest that probably less than half of the optometrists out there take even a few minutes to look at that and feel comfortable uh, understanding what that means and how they can better prescribe for the person's needs and and I don't I just think we we need to emphasize it all the way from optometry school on out that it doesn't take very long I always say that you know, I understand everyone's busy and many people are working under uh, third party plans that don't really compensate them well for the kind of time that they might want to spend with a patient. But I had a general practice for 15 years and, you know, I did a few of these tests on everyone. It doesn't take very long to do a cover test, a near point of convergence, some pursuits and saccades. And then when you have them in the foropter, maybe to do um, a for you. And, and a virgins and a fused cross cylinder and an NRA PRA at near, especially because many of those the patients you're doing it with they're younger or even if they're adults, you know they're they're quick and they can respond uh, pretty easily and it, it just adds a couple of minutes to the exam and it really is a it's a win win you know it's a win for the patient when they get the right thing and for those practices that dispense you know I I worked in um. Uh, when I had my general practice, I dispensed eyewear. But before that, I worked for some doctors who um, 
you know, who, who had the dispensing side, I wasn't part of that. And um, they actually dispensed a lot more eyewear because I was prescribing a lot of near near point prescriptions for patients that otherwise would have gone away without anything. And so it was a win for the patient and a win for the practice. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Especially lately, I mean, low plus, you know, I, I got parents coming in every day saying, my kids are looking at the computer all day long, what, you know, do something. <laughs> and that's what right. I grabbed and, the plus and the 50s. Is, why do they want you to do something? Is the child complaining they can't see afterward? Are they rubbing their eyes? Are they uncomfortable? Are they just saying, I can't, you know, do this anymore? And, you know, some of his children should get up and move. They shouldn't be sitting all the time. But a lot of it is that we as human beings were, are not well designed to do near centered work over a period of time. It doesn't mean that we can't do it. I think, um, I think it was Dr. Skeffington who said that, you know, all this near work is, um, you know, is uh, something that is biologically, uh, you know, it's a demand, but it's biologically unacceptable. It's not something that we, it's socially compulsive and biologically unacceptable. We're not, take a look at our systems. You know, if you look at galvanic skin response, if you look at other kinds of stress responses, you'll find that if someone does near centered work, you know, for more than maybe a few minutes, there are uh, markers that go up in terms of stress on the system because that's not, you know, we used to be hunters and gatherers, not readers and writers. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. I, I, um, I, I, this has been a really, I think, important and and excellent discussion. And I'd love to, maybe we ha need to do another one of these. There's so much more to get into, and and especially if we do live podcasting, I think this would be a great opportunity um, for people to ask questions. Um, Cheryl, do you have anything you want to add, or or any other questions that you want to ask of Kathy? I don't have any other questions tonight, but I do think it would be really cool to have her back at a time when we are on a live podcast, because I think there's a lot of um, our listeners who are very, very passionate about myopia management, but are also extremely passionate, um, not only passionate, but also knowledgeable about binocular vision. And I think it would be really cool to have them chime in and ask, um, you know, maybe even deeper questions and kind of have a little back and forth with Kathy. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, me too. For sure. Yeah, I, would, uh, I would love to do that. And I, I do think that I always like to have as many tools in my toolbox as possible. That's what I always say. And so whether it's, you know, soft multifocals or ortho K or vision therapy or prescribing plus veneer or, you know, small amounts of prism because of fixation disparity or some other condition that I see. Um, I think we need to think about it all and and uh, prioritize it as best we know how, but always know that it it's available and uh, and it can be atropine as well. But but all of these things are out there and uh, it can be a little overwhelming when you have all these choices. But a lot of patients will kind of lead you that in the right direction in terms of the testing. And those that don't, well, we all get our challenges and, and that's not a bad thing. And, uh, you know, we start simple and then we add as we need to. Well said. Um, I have one last question for you, Kathy, because you're a badass in both communities, the uh, myopia control community and the VT community. And this question just keeps getting raised <laughs> over and over again about how best can the, these two groups work together. So if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, uh, being a big deal in both of these communities, like what do you think? What's the best way that we can work together? So, so the first thing is that when you have conferences, you know, I know that we separate ourselves when we have conferences because it is good to concentrate on one thing for a few days at a time to, to you know, up your skills and stay concentrated on one topic and not feel like you're all over the place. But I do think that the first thing is that when AOMC meets, there should always be, and there has been, lectures that involve uh, vision therapy or aspects of vision therapy. I think when, you know, COVD or Nora or one of the, or OEP, you know, has uh, uh, various lectures, then all these things uh, like ortho K should be part of, let's say a COVD meeting. Um, 
or or maybe even a NORA meeting. And you know, OEP tends to kind of cover a little bit of everything. Um, and I think they're doing a lot now with COVID uh, to do more uh, lectures. And so if there haven't been uh, many on um, you know Earth OK, there should be some some lectures because they've covered other topics, not just vision therapy. Um, and in fact, that's what most people don't know. Many, many years ago, uh, you know, OEP was an organization that they used to have these monthly papers that they used to send out to the doctors on different topics. And they did low vision and they did contact lenses and they did pathology and they did vision therapy. It wasn't just vision therapy. Um, and then some of those things kind of split off. It's sort of like how I feel about, you know, aspects of low vision. Um, that you know, it should just be included at least some in these other meetings because there's a lot of overlap and because we wanna make sure that every doctor at least is familiar with it and, and at least it hits their brain enough when the patient is sitting in the chair that they'll at least think of it. And if they're not fully comfortable with it, well, that's why we're referring to each other. You know, AOMC did that a, a number of years ago when they started that uh, practice independence, that evening program that they had. It was wonderful. And that came out of the fact that you know, everyone was kind of whining about insurance plans and things like that. And um, and it was like, well, you know what? We all have these different skills. Why don't we learn a little more about what each of us does, whether it's nutrition or or ortho-K or, uh, you know, vision therapy or low vision or whatever it is and, and find a way to refer between us because there's so much out there that can be so helpful to the patient. And that's really the key. We always need to keep the patient at the top of the list. Well said. And the way to do that is, I think, interacting. You know, some of us are part of all these organizations, and that's nice. But I do think that um, that at least uh, encouraging the education committees of these organizations to include some of that, I think, will is a start. Yeah, yeah, we could definitely benefit for with a, improved communication and having a presence in each other's programs for sure. And, uh, and we'll wrap it up with that. I'm excited to pursue a part two. And uh, for those of you who are watching or listening to this, um, if you're enjoying this and you want more of it, then I invite you to become a member of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Because believe it or not, there's a whole group of very passionate men and women out there who give their real life money to support an organization and make these podcasts and our meetings and our education happen because they believe in it and they think that this is important. They want us to share the word and that's what we're doing. And so we could do more content, have more experts like Kathy on, do more episodes with our amazing panel and, uh, and do future episodes. So if you're interested in becoming a member, aaomc.org is our website. And I'll just go uh, real quick. Uh, Kathy, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, uh, how, do, how should they do that? Email, phone, whatever you want. The, the easiest thing is probably email, and it's just my name spelled out. It's Dr. Stern, D-O-C-T-O-R-S-T-E-R-N at gmail.com. Great. And uh, Paul, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you on the internet? The Gmail is probably the best bet, plevineod at gmail.com. And Cheryl? I also love Gmail. Uh, my email is dr. Cheryl Chapman. That's dr. C H E R Y L C H A T M A N at Gmail. And we will complete the Gmail uh, Voltron. If you want to email the podcast, the <laughs> corrected view at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, and uh, these kind of discussions happen there. We have a Discord channel. We, Like I said, we have uh, the Google group where this very conversation started. Uh, when a couple of members started talking about it. So Kathy, thank you. Paul, thank you. Cheryl, thank you. And I know Jonathan's listening. So Jonathan, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll get Thanks. him back in for part two. And I was glad to be able to at least get one question from him because I was like, man, we lost Jonathan. I really wanted him to be a part of this. So I'm glad we at least got to get one question from him. So with that, we'll see everybody next time. Right. On the next Bye, episode. everybody. Thank you.